Hello everyone, thank you for joining me again. My name's Michael, I'm the Minister at Hoonhae Presbyterian and I'm continuing this week with another instalment in the Salt Shaker series. This week I'm looking at body, soul and spirit. To be an effective church, we need individually and together to have what is called a sound biblical anthropology. This is a clear doctrine of what it means to be a human being. Today I want to focus specifically on the physical body and this should be immediately relevant to us as we all have a body of course. And just what is the spiritual significance of this frame that we walk around in and have our being? That's the focus today. The body and associated topics such as food are basic to human existence. But for some reason, I'm not, and I'm not sure why, we don't often talk about them in church. But I do want to talk about it today. It's consistent with the whole council of scripture that we are tripartite or triune beings, body, soul and spirit. These are three centres of consciousness within the total being of a person. Last week, if you've been following this series, I mentioned that we're made in God's image and the apex of the creation. We're formed from dust and our whole lives are animated and sustained by the Creator, the Creator God, in quite a mysterious and a miraculous way. So let's get into this topic. Firstly, though, I want to begin by reading a key scripture. So let's go there now. First Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 to 20, reading from the NIV. Paul speaking, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead. And so, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price, and therefore honour God with your bodies. I'll be mentioning these three aspects of the self, body, soul and spirit, and focus on each, but as I mentioned a moment ago, more specifically the body. But let's realise from the outset that this is for the purpose of analysis only. In reality, and we all know this, the three aspects of our self are all integrated in terms of our lived reality, and we can't separate them, much like an egg that has been beaten, and once that's been done, the white and the yolk can't be unseparated. No, they're blended together. Well, that's how it is for these aspects of the self. I think that is a helpful analogy. So let's take a closer look at the biblical anthropology of the self. The body is most obvious to us because it's tangible. Psalm 139 captures the marvel and mystery of the body in a pre-scientific but still profoundly accurate manner. Here's some facts about the body, just a few, and we could cite many more. Millions of light-sensitive nerve cells at the back of the eye relay information to the brain through a bundle of nerve fibres forming the optic nerve. The brain analyses this information, and as a result, we see in a split second. 
incredible. The lens of each eye focuses light on the retina, which is like a screen at the back of our eyes. And to focus, it changes shape around about 100,000 times per day. Compared to other creatures, we have a large brain for our body size. And the grey part of our brain is coiled to fit inside the skull. If it was flattened out, it would fit on an ironing board. Another fact, we have around 96,000 kilometres of blood vessels in our bodies. And if we stretched these out in a line, they would reach around the earth two and a half times. And finally, most cells are so small that over 200 could fit into a full stop on a printed page. And we each have around one trillion cells inside our body. That's incredible. There's just a few facts. Psalm 139, David says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And God is the author of our creation. All aspects of the self, as I said, are integrated. And what happens in the body affects the soul and the spirit and vice versa. So if we're feeling stressed, we have this instinctive flight or fight response. And a stress hormone called cortisol is released. And this raises our blood pressure and makes us feel more alert. So there's just one way that body, soul and spirit are all integrated. We can say that they are distinguishable. We can talk about the three aspects, but they're actually, in reality, in lived experience, indivisible. That's an important point. So if you've been following in this series, you'll know that I've spoken about spirit and more particularly the soul over the last few weeks. And I'll just touch on these again. It seems appropriate. So when we speak about the human spirit, we're talking about the small s spirit. And this is an indeterminate and unseen aspect of the self that's made in the divine image to respond to the revelation of God and commune with God in worship. The spirit, the human spirit, is created by God, Zechariah 12 verse 1. And because we're made in God's image, it means that we are able to worship God who is spirit. The faculties of the human spirit are intuition, conscience and communion. Intuition is an inbuilt sense of knowing. It's a protective thing, as is the conscience. It's an inbuilt moral barometer. And it's telling us what's right and wrong. But we can ignore the conscience. We can have what Paul calls a seared conscience. And we can just override it and carry on anyway. And we can commune with God. I like what the psalmist in Psalm 42 speaks of. He says, Deep unto deep, when we commune with God, we know God as he is revealed to us. At the fall, the spirit of human beings lost contact with God, and this can only be restored through generation in the new birth in Christ. Here's some verses that mention the human spirit. Firstly, from Proverbs 20, verse 27, the Lord's light penetrates the human spirit. That is a really interesting, um, an interesting comment. The light of God penetrates the human spirit. And what does it do? It exposes every hidden motive. Job 32, verse 8, but it is the spirit in a person. The breath of the Almighty, there we go, our spirit is the breath of Almighty God, that gives them understanding. So our spirit, and not just our mind, is involved in knowing and understanding. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. And finally, from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, from the Amplified Bible, it says, For what person knows the thoughts and motives of a man, except the man's spirit within us? 
so also so also no one knows the thoughts of god except the spirit of god so this is a further verse speaking of the human spirit knowing to recap on the soul the soul is that aspect of a person that is self-determined it's the eye of our lives with the mind we think we say all the time well i think whenever we use the word i that single letter word we're in the realm of the soul our thoughts are unique at sometimes times sometimes they're random at other times they are they are reasoned and discerned our thoughts can be good or evil spiritually speaking and both will produce a particular lifestyle the soul is also composed of the will this is our wants it's what drives us to live as we do it is the domain of choice and the soul is also concerned with our emotions how we feel whenever we say or i say look i feel this or i feel that we're actually very emotional creatures aren't we the soul under control if i can put it that way the soul under control is aware of these three dimensions and how they operate and by implication a soul out of control isn't able to rein these things in given our unique genetic makeup the environment that we grow up in and our life experiences the soul of an individual makes up a very unique personality and it's a bit of a paradox but we are basically the same because we all operate in these things as human beings and yet we're at the same time also infinitely different here's a favorite verse concerning the soul that i've really been reflecting on a lot lately it comes from psalm 19 verse 7 and it says the law of the lord is perfect converting or sanctifying making righteous the soul the decrees of the lord are trustworthy making wise the simple when the holy spirit penetrates our soul we want and delight in making godly choices if we don't invite the holy spirit to help us with self-control we will just do our own thing so let's come to the body the body is the worldly conscious aspect of the self which experiences reality through the five senses and it reasons with the mind unlike the spirit and soul which are unseen the body is tangible and each person embodies that means has within this frame that they walk around in a spirit and a soul and much of these many these aspects reflect the nature and character of god a being that is made in the image the divine image an unredeemed person is consumed with soulish things in the body and they often like to indulge their body and its desires we think most obviously of food and sex but there are very clear warnings in scripture about the physical body and we've just read from 1 Corinthians 6 verse uh, 1 Corinthians 6 about the body as temple but in Philippians 3 verses 18 and 19 Paul talks elsewhere about how not to treat the body and in those verses he talks about those who profess to follow Christ but want Christ without the cross and in tears He's really laboring the point he's trying to warn them about worldly lusts including the body he makes reference to food he says their god is their belly which is real straight talk paul was writing to people in very pagan cultures and so he says and i i'm quoting from the king james i beseech you and in philippians he says I, i'm telling you this with tears so get the point and as it was for his original readers so it is for us so how do we treat the body he says in romans 12 that we're to treat the body as a living sacrifice and i'll come back to this in just a moment most of us i think it's fair to say most of the time 
don't really think about the body. We tend to think about it when something goes wrong. And I have to say, and it's quite coincidental in terms of my preaching schedule, that this issue has been quite personal for me this week. I have a long-standing problem of hypertension. Medically, it doesn't have any essential cause, and so it's sometimes called, seems a bit of a misnomer, but it's called essential hypertension. And as a result of some tests that I've had recently, I've found that, um, or it has been discovered, that my kidney function has decreased because the heart and the kidneys, all those visceral organs actually, are very interconnected. But when the heart's under pressure, the kidneys are also under pressure and they have trouble doing their work. When we get a medical report or a doctor gives us some news that is really, really hard and it shakes us, we do think about the mortality of our bodies. But it shouldn't really take those sort of events to do so, because if we're wise as believers, we will have a good understanding of the body, even when it's functioning well. Now, everybody has some condition sooner or later in life. We don't escape unscathed. Interesting with the kidneys, because they are sometimes referred to as the reins. And from that word reins, we get the word renal, which refers to kidneys. The scripture from Genesis through to Revelation has a lot to say about blood. Life is in the blood of all creatures. And blood is associated with sacrifice. Jesus' blood flowed for our transgressions. And also, Isaiah tells us uh, prophetically, we are healed by his stripes, which is wounds, which produce blood. And this is a really important teaching. I think I may need to come back to it in some future message, talking about the blood of Christ. But let's just say this. There is more cosmic power in one drop of Jesus's blood than all of Satan's power and authority. When we understand what the blood of Christ achieved spiritually and in terms of God's redemptive plan, we realise that there truly is, as the old hymn says, power in the blood. When we receive communion, do we see it as having potential to claim healing in Christ? Because by his blood shed for us, we are saved and healed and delivered. The simple um, appropriation of the communion elements can be a healing moment if we ask for it in our heart and we approach the communion table reverently and in full knowledge of what Christ has done for us. Let's look at one very relevant aspect of the body and how it functions, food. Now earlier in, in our reading Paul says you know food is for the body the stomach is for food and food is for the body, but the body, he says, is the Lord's. We actually don't own our bodies. Now that jars with culture, doesn't it? Because everyone thinks in this age of self-determination and uh, independence that their body is their own. Well, that is profoundly at odds with what scripture teaches. We're stewards of the body. And a steward on a plane or a ship or a train serves customers, looks after them, is attentive to their needs. We're stewards of the body. Eating, I want to suggest, is not just a physical act, but it is profoundly spiritual if we stop and think about it. But we often don't stop and think about it. We just gulp our food down. And our relationship with food is emotional. That includes the soul. And it's deeply spiritual. And it's spiritual because it directly affects our ability to function. And that matters to God. Food relates to body, soul and spirit. How does it relate to the soul? Because food, for most people anyway in Western societies, perhaps not in other societies, food is about choice. And we make choices around food. 
what we'll eat, when we'll eat, how much we'll eat, and so on. And these choices, of course, relate to the mind and the spiritual heart, to our will and to our emotions. Somebody might say, look, I'm an emotional eater. When I'm feeling good, I eat and I still feel good. Or if I'm not feeling good, I'm feeling sad or mad or angry, I still eat. You know, that person has to understand their emotions and their relationship with food. A verse here from Isaiah 55 verse 2. Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen, and I will tell you where to get food that is good for your soul. We could say, I suppose, that's food for thought. So we come to the temple teaching, which refers back to the scripture that we read before. Paul is making reference to the Jewish temple and its sacrifices. Now, if we know anything about the temple in the Old Testament, um, there was elaborate ritual and preparation. There are outer courts, as we can see in this image here. And you don't just bowl in and march into what's called the Holy of Holies. And you can see in that insert image there what is in the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant and the, div the divider, which divides um, the, the priest and anyone else from more earthly things to come into the very presence of God. This is a very sacred space. So we progress from the outer courts where there's noise and bustle and uh, talk into uh, this very sacred enclosure, the Holy of Holies. And there's a solemn awareness of God's presence in preparing the animal for sacrifice by the high priest. He did it once a year, and he had to be very, very careful to follow the protocol that God had given, or he risked physical death. Um, Corinth, too, to whom Paul was writing, the believers at Corinth, was a large cosmopolitan city. It was a bustling center of commerce and also um, associated pagan worship and moral laxity. So Paul wants to teach very strongly about this body and getting it right before the Lord. Knowing his readers, and especially Jews, would understand the reference, Paul makes this quite astounding claim. He says, your body, my body, your body, is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And elsewhere in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, which is another key scripture in this, he speaks of the body as a living sacrifice. Now, that's not a contradiction in terms to speak of a living sacrifice because there is still a death going on. And what Paul's talking about is the soulish self, the mind, the will, the emotions being laid down on the altar, as it were, like the Old Testament sacrifices. Because true worship, Paul says, is about mind renewal and presenting our bodies as fully yielded to God. Now, most of us don't know the will of God. And we won't know the will of God, according to Romans 12, 1 to 3, until we meet God's condition to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. So our bodies are really important in worship. And I think in our culture and even in many churches and in the lives of many believers, we don't know that. Some years ago, when I was teaching some senior students about uh, this passage of scripture, and the topic came up about tattooing. And I think most of us will know that tattooing is very, very prevalent in our culture now. Um, many years ago, I can remember that maybe somebody who had been a sailor might have had an anchor or a love me something up their arm. But um, these days, tattooing is really resting on the assumption that the body is a canvas and we can do with it what we want, just like we would paint uh, on a canvas. And I want to add just here that I'm not absolutely not judging anybody who has tattoos. We make our own choices. I'm merely trying to uh, illustrate here by analogy what I think this scripture is, this particular scripture is teaching. 
So in this discussion with the senior students, we talked about the body as a temple and I said to them, and I wasn't being provocative, I was only trying to unpack this particular scripture, but I said to them, here's a spray can, go down to that church down the road and just see it as a canvas and spray all over it, whatever you want. And they said, well, no, that's not right. And I said, why? And they said, because that's a, that's a sacred building. And I said, well, have a look again at what the scripture is teaching. The body is a temple. It's a sacred place. We don't approach it casually. We approach it in due reverence. And we need to be like that with our bodies. Um, this is very countercultural because in our day and age, just like the pagans of old at Corinth, most people think they can do whatever they want with their bodies, but we're all going to be accountable to the Lord with what we've done in the body. So we need to be very careful. So here's the challenge for everybody listening to this, and it's a challenge to me too as I record it. How do you and I view our body in the light of the temple teaching? Do you and I treat the body with the reverence that God requires? Do we need to repent and be better stewards of that which comes from God and belongs to God? So I leave those questions with you for your reflection and consideration. But we'll just close this message now with a prayer. Lord, in light of what I've heard today, I want to make a decision to present my body to you on the altar, and now I am but a steward of it. I don't own it. Please give me the grace to stay faithful and send your Holy Spirit afresh to help me, and Lord, to heal me, because you know that parts of my body need your healing. Lord, forgive me, please, in your grace, when I haven't treated the body well. Help me to eat wisely. I acknowledge that the greatest single contributor to physical health is the Holy Spirit. I read that in your word in Romans 8, verse 11. You can do all things, Lord, and I acknowledge that, but you expect me to do my part. And the great thing is, you promise to help me, the Comforter, the Paraclete, the Holy Spirit who comes alongside, who advocates for me and helps me. Lord, I declare these things this day and ask for your help. And I thank you for every good thing in Jesus' name. Amen.